The top story is live from the Sky News City studio. A warning that the state pension age may have to rise to 70 by 2050 due to the pressure on public finances. Defence contractor Babcock facing a hit of up to £100 million over its contract to deliver frigates to the Royal Navy. Tesla to cut prices to boost demand as a new report suggests interest in electric cars may be waning. Plus calls to establish a national platform to bridge the digital skills gap. Good morning, this is Ian King live in our business and economic news from the heart of the city. Now, the state pension age may have to be raised by the government to 70 by 2050 due to pressure on the public finances. That's the warning today from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which also points out that nine in ten workers are saving less than is needed for a decent standard of living in retirement. The IFS is now launching a two-year review into possible pensions reform, overseen by Alistair Darling, the former Labour Chancellor, and David Gork, the former Conservative Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Well, joining me now is Carl Emerson. He's the uh, Deputy Director of the IFS. Carl, good to see you this morning. I mean, we should state at the outset, the situation is very, very healthy, but it's this demise of uh, so-called final salary pensions coming down the line that is going to cause problems. Yeah, certainly the situation for current pensioners, at least That's on average, good. their incomes are holding up very well relative to the working age population. And in terms of poverty rates, um, the, the system's working well in the sense that pensioners are less likely to be in poverty than the working age population. So that's not the motivation for our review. What we're worried about is actually those successes for today's pensioners might be making us a bit complacent about what the future might hold. And we're really worried about the fact that, yes, we've got lots more private sector employees into pensions. That's a great success. But most of them are not saving very much. We've also got increasing numbers of people in self-employment. And yet the numbers of self-employed who are engaging with a pension has declined very dramatically over the last 25 years. So concerns that perhaps many private sector workers, employees or self-employed, just aren't doing enough to give them the retirement that they might expect. Why is it that self-employed people in particular are not saving as much? It is a little bit of a mystery. Um, we've seen a decline in the engagement in pensions amongst the self-employed right the way through since about the mid-1990s. Um, it's a remarkable change over that period. We've now got fewer than one in five self-employed people saving in a pension. And that wouldn't matter if, for example, they were just self-employed for a short period of time and perhaps they were saving when they were an employee. But the drop in pension engagement amongst the self-employed is actually biggest amongst those who are long-term self-employed. So that really is cause for a concern. And even those self-employed who are saving in a pension often put in relatively small amounts. Obviously, they don't get an employer contribution. And often those amounts stay fixed in cash terms for very long periods of time. So we're worried about their saving patterns too. And in terms of those who are in private uh, sector employment, I mean, you, you make clear that 30 to 40 year olds are not really saving enough right now. Would it help if the employer contribution was, was raised by, on a mandatory basis? There's going to be various things that we'll look at. Should we be um, defaulting people in at higher contributions, either from themselves or from their employers, is clearly one thing that we should consider. That would be building on the success of automatic enrolment, where the government has managed um, over the last decade or so to move to a situation where fewer than half of private sector workers are in a pension, the one where amongst employees it's almost um, 90 percent. So th those are certainly options on the table for our review, saving more perhaps, retiring later perhaps, or indeed at least accepting that the living standards in retirement perhaps won't keep pace with what current pensioners on average are enjoying. Now, what about the, the state pension age? Uh, clearly, uh, it's going to put more p pressure on the public finances. I mean, the current triple lock has lifted people out of poverty. What, outline for me, if you would, please, Carl, what the impact would be on the public finances if the current arrangements remain in place and all other things remain equal? One option to help people with their retirement saving is, of course, to make the state pension more generous. But that does look difficult in a world where, on the government's projections over the next 50 years... Um, we'll be spending the equivalent of 100 billion a year more on the state pension because of the triple lock, because of an aging population, because of people living longer at older ages. And that comes on top of an increasing bill for the NHS and social care. So, you know, the state perhaps could do more, but that's already looking difficult given those projections. So I think we do need to look at solutions that involve individuals or employers um, doing more. We also have to look at the risks that people are bearing as well. 
What about public sector pensions? They're obviously incredibly generous compared with most private sector pensions. Is that going to fall under your review as well? Are you going to look at that? It's not going to form part of our review, particularly for the reason you just say. Actually, um, public sector pensions don't look like they're causing any problems in terms of the adequacy of those workers' pensions once they get to retirement. There are issues there clearly about whether they're the best use of taxpayer money to get and retain the public sector workers we want. Clearly, at the moment, you might wonder whether, for example, higher pay and perhaps less generous pensions would be a better deal for all. But we're going to be focused on where we think that the pension system isn't delivering decent standards of living or risk of not delivering a decent standard of living in retirement. So public sector pensions don't look like they're causing that kind of problem. And of course, that helps quite a few private sector workers, too, because they may well be married to somebody who works in the public sector. All right, Carl, got to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Some other business news stories for you now. And the outsourcing and defence contractor Babcock warned this morning that it may face a one-off hit of between 50 to £100 million related to its contract to deliver five Type 32 frigates to the Royal Navy. Babcock said that costs on the project had been pushed up due to inflation and that it had been talking to the Ministry of Defence as to who was responsible for the additional costs under the contract. It said it had been unable to reach an agreement with the MOD and that as a result a dispute resolution process had begun which could lead to an arbitration. Babcock warned that without recovery of the additional costs the contract would be loss making and that a one-off provision would be required to cover the duration of the contract. Babcock shares are currently off two and a quarter percent. One Disco, the under fire software company, said this morning it had been told by the Financial Conduct Authority that it is under investigation by the regulator. The Sheffield based company said the investigation related to certain regulatory announcements it had released between the beginning of last year to 9th of March this year that may have materially misstated its financial position. Well, the news comes two weeks after One Disco's chief executive and chief financial officer stepped down after the company discovered accounting irregularities. And the bookseller and stationery retailer WH Smith has this morning reported better than expected half-year profits. The company, which has been repositioning itself from its traditional high street retail operations towards outlets at railway stations and airports, reported a pre-tax profit of £45 million for the six months to the end of February. That was up from £18 million in the same period a year earlier. Well, Carl Cowling, the chief executive, hailed a return to air travel and commuting for the improvement. He said that by the end of the current financial year, WH Smith's travel division would account for more than 70% of sales and around 80% of profits. Some breaking news for you now, and the UK has slipped down the global rankings of countries involved in the export of goods and services. Figures published in the last half hour by the Department for International Trade reveal that the UK is now seventh globally for goods and services exports, down from fifth in 2020. The UK's ranking in imports of goods and services remained unchanged at sixth. Well, the value of UK total trade in the 12 months to the end of January came in at £1.7 trillion. That was up 26.4% on the previous 12 months. Well, with me now is Simon French. He's Managing Director and Head of Research at Pamuel Gordon. Simon, good to see you this morning. You. Um, what struck me is that the terms of trade for non-EU countries is less favourable to the uh, UK than uh, it is with EU countries. The, the trade deficit appears bigger. Yes, and this is a feature of the type of things that the UK has been forced over the last 12 months to import, particularly uh, natural resources, particularly natural gas. And, and that is dominating the trade picture, actually, not just in the UK, around the world. Of course, that will start to go into reverse. So looking ahead, as we always must with this data, we'll start to see those terms of trade rather improving, I suspect, given where wholesale gas prices, we have to say, the price of natural gas, although very uncomfortable for lots of businesses and households, has sent a signal to suppliers around the world in terms of trade to up capacity, up their shipments of liquefied natural gas, helping getting prices down. It's yeah. the function of prices that's a very healthy thing in capitalist markets. Absolutely. I mean, and to what extent are these figures distorted by gold imports and exports? I mean, it's something that constantly messes with the trade figures. It is, and uh, one of your colleague Ed Conway writes extensively about this, doesn't he? And the, the distortion of, uh, of non-monetary gold, particularly the UK, which is a big uh, custodian of gold and therefore cross-border flows does 
disrupt the headline trade figures. When you strip that out, you do see a problem, and this ranking you mentioned in your introduction is symptomatic of this. The UK is running a persistent trade deficit even when the sterling index is down at levels, or subdued levels, a two-decade low, and against the dollar briefly at a four-decade low. It doesn't seem to really be helping the structural trade balance when you strip out those disruptive forces, of which non-monetary gold is one of them. Yeah, which, of course, brings us on to the inflation data, which we, mm -hmm. we had yesterday. I mean, the UK <clears throat> has the highest rate of inflation in, in Europe now. It's obviously particularly... I mean, the UK's always had a problem with sticky yep. inflation. Is that down to the fact that we, we import so much more than we export? <laughs> The trade deficit is clearly part of this story, and the fact that uh, food is such a crucial component part of this, going up 19%, almost twice the rate of headline inflation, the fact that we import a large part of our, our food base is part of that, and the weakness of sterling just amplifies that effect. The problem, of course, here is um, when you look and you try and benchmark global food price inflation, actually, even areas that have quite uh, considerable export volumes have faced quite considerable food inflation as well. That fertiliser cost, a very intensive energy-intensive part of the production process, feeds through with a lag. And although those prices have come down, crop cycles are not done in the matter of days, weeks. Contracting is done over multiple years. So although the headline uh, input price that will drive food is coming down, Consumers aren't seeing this at the moment, and they will be frustrated by that. It's become, going to become intensely political in the UK and across the world in the coming months of our profiteering. Well, is it, well, it's a very good point you raise that, because, I mean, the ONS in its statement yesterday said that while wholesale food prices were coming down, supermarkets weren't yet passing that on. I mean, that's... Well, the ONS dipping its toe in political waters there. It is. I mean, the ONS, the statis uh, statisticians are dipping their toe into this. Central banks have dipped their toe into this. But this is the purview of the uh, Competition and Markets Authority. I think they are the people who we need to be hearing from, because otherwise you have people who really don't have a role. They ONS to measure, central banks to manage inflation, but in terms of if you think that the bargaining process between suppliers uh, and consumers is, is inappropriate, not fit for purpose, the CMA get involved. I think there are too many commentators on the pitch, if, uh, if I dare say so. I uh, completely agree. I mean, but the CMA has looked at uh, grocery retail in this country several times over the last couple of decades. They've never concluded that there was an issue with competition. I mean, Tesco, Sainsbury's, the, all of them, their margins mm. are less than 5% in most cases. I mean, that doesn't look like a market in which uh, they're, they're, ho you know, they're hogging profits and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're correct. I mean, you and I have been in the market long enough to see these a succession of reviews. More a decade or so ago, most of these reviews. But each and every one of them, and many people teed up the CMA and their predecessors to do uh, the mergers of, uh, not really mergers uh, authority to look at this never found a case of profiteering. Now, you can argue that the balance of consumers versus suppliers is not fit for purpose, but that is a political instruction given to the CMA in their terms of reference. It's never found that supermarkets have been profiteering. It's part of the UK economy, which you would say is intensely uh, competitive, and that's what you want in capital markets. You want competition. It's not about free markets, it's about competitive markets, and that's where the CMA have to uh, state what they want and whether they're seeing behaviours because of the flux of the pandemic, because of the flux of the, uh, the war, because of the flux of Brexit, whether that has changed the dynamic we've become very used to, particularly in the supermarket sector, over the last 20 years. Before I let you go, just yes. one uh, more thought on the uh, trade numbers. I mean, the, the UK actually rose in the rankings for foreign direct investment in the period that uh, was being measured, second in the world now. I mean, that's, is that down to all these takeovers of UK companies that people are getting so agitated about? Yes, and it is part of the... Uh, bright spot actually in financial services is deal making in terms of inward investment into mergers, looking particularly at public companies which are priced at a considerable discount to their global peers. If public market investors are not prepared to value those appropriately, we are seeing both international capital and private domestic capital saying, well, if public markets in the UK are not going to do it, we'll come along and value that appropriately accordingly. So, yes, a bright spot driven by currency, driven by that persistent valuation discount. All right, Simon, got to leave it there. Great to see you this morning. Thank you.
Bit of breaking uh, news to bring you, and that there have been uh, fears that the animal rights group Animal Rising, which disrupted the Grand National last Saturday, had similar plans for the London Marathon this weekend. In the last few minutes, the group has released a statement denying that. A spokesperson said Animal Rising has no intention to disrupt the London Marathon this weekend. Our action this year is intended to shine the spotlight on other animals and our relationship to them. Some more business news for you now. And the outsourcing group Capita warned this morning that customer supply or colleague data may have been accessed by hackers in a recent cyber attack. Capita, which collects the TV licence fee on behalf of the BBC and whose other clients include Plymouth City Council, Bayern Munich Football Club and Transport for London, said there was some evidence of limited data uh, in exfiltration from the small proportion of its servers affected. It said the majority of its client services were not impacted by the incident and remained in operation. It has now restored virtually all client services that were impacted. Shares of Jet2 rose by 1% this morning after the tour operator said full year profits would be better than expected. Jet2 said forward bookings for the summer had remained encouraging to date. It's looking to sell 7.2% more seats this summer than the same period last year, with package holiday customers representing just over three quarters of total departing passengers. Well, profits for the year are now expected to come in at between £387 and £392 million. Pounds. Now, the UK government last month set mandates for car manufacturers requiring 22% of the new cars they sell next year to be zero emission. That will rise to 80% by 2030. Well, all of that compares with the 16% of the market currently accounted for by sales of battery electric vehicles in the last month. Those are the figures from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. But according to the online automotive marketplace Auto Trader, interest in electric cars may be waning. Well, joining me now is Erin Baker. She's editor director at Auto Trader. Erin, good to see you this morning. Why do you say interest is waning? Hi there. Yeah, well, according to our figures on Auto Trader, uh, interest in new electric cars is down by 65% year on year. It's a slightly nuanced picture because actually sales and interest in used EVs remain pretty robust and are actually at their strongest that they've been ever at 6% market share. But certainly there's a huge drop off in interest for new electric cars. And you're measuring interest here by sort of searches on, on the site? Exactly, ad views, yeah. Right. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there are three key things. The first is cost of living crisis. You know, it's affecting us all. Uh, the average, the sticker price of an electric car is still on average 37% more, more than it is for petrol or diesel. So people that are thinking about going electric, and a lot of consumers really do still want to make that switch, are looking at their monthly household budgets and thinking, you know, 37% more expensive. Um, there's also a lot of worries about charging, the charging network. Is it there? How much does it cost? In particular, you know, this, this lack of VAT equality on domestic versus public charging, if you go to a public charger, a rapid charger in particular, you're paying that 20% VAT, and actually that can make it quite hefty. Yeah, now overnight, Elon Musk at Tesla hinted at further price cuts over, over coming months. Is that symptomatic of this waning decline? It's not just a, a UK factor. It must be global if Tesla are talking about this. It is global. You know, the car brands are global. They operate across different markets. If we look at other markets where they have successfully bought EVs on board and there's strong consumer demand and take up, you know, you're looking at a lot of government incentives having to be there. You look at the UK, where are our government incentives? You know, we had a plug-in grant. It's largely gone. We had a domestic charging grant is largely gone. Uh, we don't have any information around battery health for consumers and you know people that want to look at a used EV are thinking well hang on the car's fine what about the battery I don't know anything about that so you know where's the standardization of messaging around that? Are you saying then that uh, the government's net zero targets are, are misguided unless they actually restore some of these incentives? I think what we see you know again if you look at used consumer demand and interest is there but so we could still be on track, 2030 could still be a viable possibility, but it's going to take the government to really, I think, step in, look at things like incentives around VAT on used cars, look at things like, look at Norway, they do free charging, free spaces, free parking, all sorts of really interesting, innovative, interesting consumer incentives to go electric, and they don't currently exist in the UK. You mentioned just now the differential between new EVs and new petrol and diesel vehicles was 37%, I think you said. Yeah, what's, right. what's it like for, for used cars? 
Used cars, it's narrowing. It depends very much on the model. I mean, actually, if you, if you think about it, for a lot of people out there, electric cars are a very new idea. But the likes of Renault Zoe, Nissan Leaf, they've been with us for over a decade now. So actually, there are some really good used car bargains out there. And there are a few models actually where price parity exists. I mean, we thought, along with other people, uh, Auto Trader, we thought we were heading for price parity between electric and petrol and diesel around the middle of this decade. It's not happening. It's not going to happen without some help, probably, from the government. But, you know, there are a few good bargains to be had out there. Now, you mentioned just now the fact that the government has been withdrawing incentives. Of course, in 2025, vehicle excise duty is going to be imposed on EVs. Is that something that you think the government perhaps ought to reconsider? Definitely, that's something for the government to consider. Along with, you know, benefit in kind for company car users is going to shift upwards. That's been a really good incentive, which probably explains why two out of three electric cars are company cars. If we want retail private purchasers to get behind electric, we need some fiscal incentives pretty soon. All right, Erin, good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come, morning, King Live. We're going to have a global look at how global markets are doing this Thursday morning. Don't go away. Breaking news. Oh, we're going to interrupt that to take you live to. Yes, of course, it has a bearing on what's happening with interest rates. We're cutting out of that to bring you some breaking <laughs> news. Could you tell us about the night that the Russians were coming? Russia is making advances. Now listen, it's <laughs> quite a time, hasn't it? Alex, tell us what's happening. This is turning into a humanitarian emergency. News never stops. Now, some breaking news for you. Neither do we. That's just come into us here at Sky News. Well, the sell-off in the oil price that began late last week picked up momentum yesterday amid growing speculation over the timing of the US interest rate rises. A barrel of Brent crude this morning hit its lowest level so far this month and is currently changing hands at $81.71 a barrel. That is down nearly one and three quarter percent on the session. On the equity market, stocks in the Asia-Pacific region had a mixed session overnight. Not really a great deal of uh, action in any of them, truth be told. Sydney, Mumbai, Hong Kong and Shanghai were all more or less unchanged. The Nikkei, meanwhile, posted a very modest gain to make it nine gains in ten sessions. Well, in Europe, markets have largely been drifting lower this morning. There you can see the uh, current picture. The DAX in Germany is off nearly three quarters of one percent, but uh, fairly uh, modest declines uh, across the board. Mixed bag of company results really, I think, uh, behind that. Talking points this morning include Renault. The French car maker is off some 7% in Paris. That's despite the fact that quarterly profits came in well ahead of expectations. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 is also in negative territory right now, and, albeit not very much, it's only 11 points off or so. Broad-based sell-off as ever on a Thursday at this time of year. There are a lot of stocks going ex-dividend. In other words, they're trading without the rights to the latest payout. Among the batch this morning are Spirac Sarko, the engineering company. Uh, if you own that one, uh, that's uh, nothing to worry about there. That's just adjusted because it's gone ex-div today off 1.5% uh, or so. Melrose, well, uh, very interesting uh, movement 
there. Uh, the price is uh, all over the place because uh, it's... Uh, Demerged its automotive engineering arm Dowlays today. So, a uh, bit of volatility uh, in that one. Again, uh, I wouldn't uh, panic too much or, or indeed uh, turn too many somersaults with joy over that particular movement that we're showing on the screen there. Bit all over the place that one today. The top blue chip gainer, meanwhile, is the warehouse owner Seagro. The shares up some 2.5% on a trading update. Meanwhile, the consumer healthcare group Halion, which was spun out of GSK in July last year, that's up 2% on news that its full year sales are going to come in at the top end of expectations. The shares have hit an all time high this morning, as I say, up 2% uh, or so. Outside the FTSE 100, Hoxile Mining is off some 10% following a drop in annual profits, but the electronic components designer discount. Discovery is up 1.5% on news that its results will be better than expected. On the foreign exchange markets, well, not very much to uh, shout about there, really. Sterling off a tenth of 1% against the US dollar and uh, a seventh of 1% right now against the euro. The single currency, meanwhile, more or less unchanged against the greenback. Joining me this morning is Anna Stupnitska. She's global macroeconomist at Fidelity International. Anna, welcome to you. Uh, obviously, we're in the thick of uh, earnings season right now, both here in Europe and in the United States. What, what are the themes catching your eye thus far? Well, uh, for this um, uh, quarter, the real question is, is this the quarter when we're going to see that uh, earnings recession that uh, has been talked about and uh, expected for a while? But obviously, uh, we know that uh, earnings seasons have been more resilient and the economic data has been more resilient. So the question is, is it going to happen now? And uh, so far, I would say it is a mixed bag. Um, we have seen generally earnings revision before the season kicked off a positive earnings revision in Europe, uh, more positivity, more optimism in, in China and Asia, um, a negative uh, earnings revision in the US. Um, and so far, um, it, it seems that the bar for positive surprise, particularly in Europe, uh, is relatively high. Uh, we have seen mixed across, uh, a mix across sectors. We're seeing a mix across regions. So a mixed bag so far. Um, and uh, we think that th this is going to be a quarter where some of that theme about uh, earnings recession is going to start coming through. Anna, in the UK, I mean, it strikes me that uh, a lot of businesses are surprising to the upside. I mean, for example, WH Smith, better than expected results today. Jet2, very positive uh, earnings update. Have UK companies just been uh, a little too pessimistic in some of the guidance they've been giving the market? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's possible because um, uh, last year in particular we saw uh, collapse in consumer confidence, uh, collapse in corporate confidence as we're approaching the winter, obviously given the, the energy shock and high energy prices. Um, the fiscal support helped uh, um, and uh, we started this year on a much more optimistic note given those worst fears did not materialize last year. Uh, so it's a little bit of a payback from last year, but there is definitely, well, there is no question that we are going towards a slowdown and recession. We expect it both here in the UK, in Europe and in the US, and that should start coming through in the data at some point, but there has been resilience so far. Anna, looking at your latest notes, as a, as a house, your underweight developed market equities and overweight emerging market equities. What's the uh, thinking behind that? Yeah, well, one uh, reason is that emerging markets overall um, had been ahead in this tightening cycle. So they hiked rates across the board uh, quite early and uh, the, the tightening cycle is finished uh, in many places, uh, perhaps except uh, for the, the Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and so in this respect, inflation has been slowing there and some central banks are expected to start cutting rates soon. Um, so uh, it is just a different point in the tightening cycle. That is one rationale for this. Of course, emerging markets are not completely immune uh, from what happens in the developed world. So if we are uh, going to see uh, a recession, if it's relatively mild, and this is what we expect for now, uh, then uh, uh, the economists, emerging markets economists can still do relatively well. But if the recession is deeper, they're not going to be immune. What is helping, of course, is the China rebound. And the China rebound story is one of the catalysts for uh, better emerging market performance over the next few months. Okay, Anna, we have to leave it there. Great to see you this morning. Appreciate Thank it. You.
Still to come here on Ian King Live, calls for a national digital skills platform to help businesses handle the rise of artificial intelligence. Don't go away. Welcome back. Our sustainability is becoming an increasingly pressing issue in the tech space. The focus now is on a circular IT economy and upcycling services, something on which the IT multinational giant Hewlett Packard Enterprise hopes to capitalise. It claims to have given a second life to more than 8.2 million technology assets, including 2.3 million servers, 3.1 million PCs and notebooks. Well, joining me now to talk about this is Matt Harris. He's HPE's UK Managing Director. Matt, good to see you this morning. So, what's happened to all this stuff? What have you done with it? Good morning, Ian. Uh, glad you referenced sustainability as a core uh, topic for a number of businesses. And if I think about IT and the contribution IT makes to global uh, emissions and carbon emissions, uh, it represents about 2 to 3% of total emissions. And as we become an increasingly digitised world, that uh, has a scale to either grow but also technology and technology companies play an incredible role of solving some of those challenges. One of the ways we, we do that, which you referenced, is in the asset upcycling and renewing of old tech to give them another lease of life. We, we do that here in the UK in one of the largest technology renewable centres uh, in Europe, just outside of Glasgow, where over 95% of the products we take in are given a second life or recycled and less than half percent go to landfill. All right, so where do they go? Um, they can go to a number of uh, markets. There might be uh, customers who don't need the latest cutting edge technology, but it suits their needs. We also look at the whole value chain of, uh, of how we source 
components when we go to the initial manufacturing stages and then what we do around the end of their life and they can be put to uh, any uh, um, uh, industry from a, a component perspective that they can't be be reused. Right. I mean, you've, you've also committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, the, the sector is notorious for uh, its activities on this front. How, how specifically are you trying to manage those lower? Yeah, I, I, I look, we think about that in three ways. First of all, if we think about our own emissions, we've taken stock of what we can control ourselves with our own operations. Uh, we have reduced by half our own emissions. Uh, that's within our direct control by 50%. We brought forward our pledge to net zero by a decade last year to 2040. But the biggest impact we can make is actually through our customers. We actually have an obligation to our customers to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. We do that by providing more efficient efficiency in the technologies that we create for them to consume. We do that through our cloud platform where we are eliminating what we call over-provisioning, over where customers have um, uh, bought more equipment that they aren't using, which is driving their sustainability uh, outcome, uh, and also through the asset upcycling. Now, the big thing that we have with, uh, which is uh, a, a great opportunity for all of all organizations and governments is uh, some of the advancements around digital technologies. And it's digital net technologies that move at the scale and the pace around solving big humanitarian problems like climate change. We do that through supercomputing. We're, we are invested in Europe and America, al allowing those, uh, uh, those governments and uh, uh, data scientists and um, uh, economists to look at how we would advance things like renewable energy uh, sustainably. And the great news that we saw uh, last month by the UK government was the announcement of a £900 million exascale computer. We applaud that from the UK government and we look forward to speaking to the government about the role we can play in that. Obviously, uh, migrating uh, services to the cloud, though, implicit in that is greater energy usage by, by data centres and, and by servers. Is that something you can really get a grip on? I think the real question here for customers and for society is getting down to a scientific baseline, looking at all of our carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. Now, offsetting that by moving where your data center is or how you're consuming technology is not an answer. Actually, it's about getting to a commonality of a metric that you can measure. If you can't measure something, you can't improve it. So by building sustainable solutions for our customers, knowing that there is a direct linkage between our use of technology as part of our business futures, but doing that sustainable way is the real key for us. All right, Matt, we've got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, a reminder to you to check out the Ian King Live podcast, which you can find by scanning the QR code that's on your screen right now. So do scan that if you want to... Uh, access our podcast that is available of course wherever you get your podcasts from including the sky news app apple and google podcasts and spotify now one of the key issues facing the uk business landscape is the urgent need for digital transformation and the ongoing digital skills crisis it raises ethical questions around emerging technologies such as generative ai and the future of various job sectors. Well, the cloud-based business solutions provider Salesforce is calling on the government to tackle this by establishing a national online digital skills platform. Joining me now to talk about this is the chief executive of Salesforce in the UK and Ireland, Zara Barola Lumi. Zara, good to see you again. Um, what would uh, this entail, this platform? Good to see you too, and I'm really pleased that you're featuring this because we've um, we've just announced some research, and, and it's it's worth talking about kind of the readiness that people feel and the importance of digital skills. And then, of course, I will talk to you about our brilliant Trailhead platform and what we're urging the government to do. But I think it's worth just just taking a step back and and why is this a crisis? So, you know, I it's been well documented. We've we've done some research. We've talked about the fact that you know, seventy five percent of people that we spoke to, and it was a large piece of research just don't feel ready for the digital skills that are needed for today and tomorrow 
And then you overlay the lens of AI and that picture becomes more acute. And today we've announced some, uh, publicized some research where we're looking at the impact of, you know, emerging technologies like generative AI and the impact on the workforce. So you look at, you look at AI, one in 10 of us don't feel equipped already for the AI skills that we need. And, you know, nearly all of our, our respondents told us that it was the most important skill to have in the next five years. And yet, despite this, and despite how people are feeling, you know, we've got to do a better job of making skills accessible and people are optimistic. So they see the value of generative AI. You know, we've just launched our, our Einstein GPT and, and the impact that it, that has in the workplace and the work to be done. So people are excited. They're not necessarily threatened or worried that it's going to replace them. And nearly all of our respondents said that businesses should be investing. 96% of them said that businesses should be investing in AI skills. So, you know, there's lots to lots to go after and really to boost our economy. So why the skills platform? Well, look, many companies like Salesforce, nearly all of our peers in the technology industry, you know, they, they have their own, we have our own kind of training initiative. We have our wonderful trailhead platform. It's free, online, gamified, digestible way to learn and acquire digital skills and we know that we can take a relatively low skilled low technical skilled person and make them job ready within as little as six months so that's an enormous achievement and and it's really kind of flexible and if I think about kind of the privilege we've had we've impacted five million people through this uh, trailhead platform and one in three people that use it go on to find employment using their salesforce skills so what okay. better way? Oh, we haven't to... got much time. Um, Sorry, I bring that to, um, I just want to ask you about the, your survey findings. Uh, you, you say that most people um, actually welcome generative AI in their workplace. They're not frightened, a majority of them, of uh, losing their jobs to it. I was quite amazed to read that. Yes. So more people are excited than they are threatened. Uh, that they'll be replaced. And when you see the impact of how it, it how it changes jobs to be done and improves productivity and efficiency, you see the massive combination of AI and human together to drive greater productivity and ease of doing business. So for example, in our Salesforce platform, Einstein GPT, if we apply it to marketing, our marketing cloud capability, we can personalize content and generate that really dynamically and apply that in a personalized way across multiple channels that reach customers for for our customers across mobile web advertising if we apply it to service we can really help service agents respond real time using real time data to generate knowledge based articles using the historical data within our sales platform and give customers a real accuracy of response so it's really important that we you know, starting back going back to this this platform this this government required platform bringing that that pool together of all of the companies and what they do, especially you know what we do with Trailhead on a consolidated platform, a one-stop shop to allow people to access and understand what's out there and really choose the pathway that will benefit them and fit with their lifestyles and incorporate that lifelong learning. Okay, Zara, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Thanks for joining me today. Lovely to see you. Thanks for having me. Time for a look now at this morning's business pages and the Financial Times leads its print edition with yesterday's UK inflation figures. The FT is currently leading its digital editions, meanwhile, with a report that Google plans to introduce generative artificial intelligence into its advertising business over coming months, potentially helping it produce far more sophisticated campaigns resembling those created by marketing agencies. The Times leads its business pages with news that a shareholder revolt to remove Helga Lund as chairman of BP is gathering momentum. It says five of the UK's biggest pension schemes plan to vote against his re-election in protest at the company's watering down of green commitments. Meanwhile, the Times also reports on its business front page that Jaguar Land Rover is to drop the 75-year-old Land Rover brand in a reboot that will also include a relaunch of Jaguar as an electric mark. Meanwhile, the Daily Telegraph, well, that also leads with inflation. It reports on the comments uh, I was discussing with Simon French earlier from the Office for National Statistics yesterday that international food prices have started falling, but the supermarkets have not yet passed these on. The Telegraph also uh, quotes 
comments from Michael O'Leary, I see. This is getting a lot of pickup on social media right now. I can tell you, Michael O'Leary, the chief executive of Ryanair, he predicted yesterday that the UK is going to rejoin the EU single market by a generation. And he says that will be because uh, a generation of European pro-Europeans will exert pressure to do that, while Brexit supporters will die out. A lot of people getting quite hot under the collar about those comments. I can't think why. Joining me today is Toro Barker. He's the Wall Street Journal's editor for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Toro, good to see you this morning. See you. Um, Tesla, obviously, uh, the big announcement overnight. Uh, <clears throat> your paper's giving it big licks today. Yeah, so... Um... They've been cutting prices for a while at Tesla. I think last year down 15 to 25 percent, depending on the model. Um, but actually, their revenue is still growing very, very strongly because that's really uh, juicing volumes. In general, the US market is heading towards electric. The percentage of electric cars in the fleet is going up quite rapidly, but also they have been quite aggressive on price at the same time. So profits down quite significantly. But, uh, but revenue continuing to grow fast. Is there a danger that he damages his brand by doing this, that he makes Tesla a more commodified product? Uh, that's clearly a, a danger. I think the reality, though, is if you want to be a scale manufacturer, manufacturer in the auto industry, you need to do that. Everybody else is catching up fast. They're launching lots of new models. And he still has uh, a much higher margin structure than the other. So even though margins came down very significantly this quarter to about 11, just over 11 percent, I think, if you look at GM and Ford, they're operating on much lower margins, between 4 and 7 percent. So he's still got room to squeeze them and generate volume. And, I, I, and I'm sure, and again, I'm not speaking for Elon's strategy, but I'm sure there's, there's plenty of opportunities within that scale to differentiate between models as well. Now, in your paper, The Wall Street Journal, there's a big read today on uh, LVMH and the succession. I mean, this is a fascinating story. It is fascinating. I mean, LVMH, is, is, as people may know now, is, is this massive company. It's, it's about half a trillion dollars and, you know, in luxury has become this behemoth. And um, so really, it's a great read. It's worth it's worth having a look at um, about uh, Bernard Arnault's four children, his sort of focus on education, on mathematics, on steeping them in the business and giving them different areas of the business to run and how he's planning to sort of choose over time who, who comes out top of that. So, yeah, a fascinating empire where, again, there's four kids uh, looking potentially to take over at some point. Yeah, France's biggest company yeah. by a country mark. Well, he's also now, when you're talking about Elon Musk, he's now the richest man in the world. Yeah. Um, or richest person in the world. So, yeah. I met him about 25 years ago, Bernie Arnold. I've, I've got to say, he's one of the most charismatic business people I've ever met. And, and a really, you know, people think of France as being quite a sort of corporatist country. He's a capitalist, red in tooth and claw. No, he's, he's built this extraordinary business from, you know, he took over the family business. Again, this article gets into it. Um, I forget the date of it, but took over and made an acquisition early on and buried within it was Christian Dior. So, you know, he then built it off the back of this. So a really interesting story of building this thing through acquisitions and aggressive and smart business practices over many, many years. Yeah, good piece. Now, uh, we're in the middle of the banking uh, update system. Uh, JP Morgan's caught your eye. Yeah, so, uh, uh, no, actually, Morgan Stanley last night, actually, JP Morgan was was earlier in the week. So um, uh, what you've seen is this sort of tale of two uh, banking models, really, which is the investment banking and the trading businesses have had a really tough time. Yeah. As we know, you know, the um, the markets have been pretty challenging. You've talked about this a lot. Deal making after this surge in 2021 has come off aggressively. So Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs obviously get hit pretty hard by that. Um, and you've seen that in the earnings. And obviously, Goldman laid off 6% of its workforce. Um, at the same time, you know, something like JP Morgan, which has a big uh, regular commercial bank and a retail bank, have done pretty well. So they had record earnings because the net interest margin, which people will, will know, means that you can, as a, as a big bank, keep your deposit rates low but charge more for loans. So the spread between those two things increases as interest rates go up. So they've actually had a great year on that net interest margin. But obviously, if you're Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, yeah. you don't have that. Yeah, absolutely. Got to leave it there, Toral. Good to see great. you today. Thank you Thank very you. much. Still to come here on Ian King Live, the role of regulators under the spotlight. I'll be joined by the chair of the Regulatory Reform Group of Conservative MPs. Stay tuned.
We'll start with breaking news. How are we going to interrupt that to take you live to... Yes, of course, it has a bearing on what's happening with interest rates. We're cutting out of that to bring you some breaking <laughs> news. Could you tell us about the night that the Russians were coming? Russia is making advances. Now listen, it's <laughs> quite a time, hasn't it? Alex, tell us what's happening. This is turning into a humanitarian emergency. News never stops. Now, some breaking news for you. Neither do we. It's just come in to us here at Sky News. Global Insight. Made local. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Reports. Sponsored by Interactive Investor. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Report, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Welcome back. Now, the recent rescues of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse have again shone the spotlight on the role of regulators, as has Ofgem's oversight of the energy sector amid the recent outcry over the enforced installation of prepay meters. Well, the regulatory reform group of Conservative backbenchers argues in a report published this week that there's insufficient parliamentary oversight of regulators, given their power and influence over Britain's economy. Well, joining me now is the Conservative MP for Hitchin and Hobbiton and chair of that group, Bim Afalami. Bim, good to see you this morning. Pleasure. Now, you're arguing that uh, these regulators are holding back and hindering economic growth. That, that's quite a claim. Well, what we're talking about is the whole regulatory system. It's important to say that there are a lot of very good regulators and, in some respects, the best respected regulators in the world. But the key is the system is not always getting the outcomes that we want. So what does that mean? It means clearer lines of accountability between what the government and politicians are responsible for and what regulators are responsible for. Clearer understanding of when decisions have been taken, why they've been taken. And that's why the question of scrutiny is so important. Because not just parliamentary, more parliamentary scrutiny, which that scrutiny role used to be was used to be done in Brussels by the European Union. Obviously, we've left the European Union now, but we haven't really replaced that with anything. So we need parliamentary scrutiny about the decisions that are being taken and why. And then also, another one of our recommendations is within government, there needs to be a much more active use of a team within government, we're calling them the oversight, you know, the oversight body of regulators, that needs to work with departments strategically to look at different areas of regulation, make sure there's no overlapping problems, identify where there are issues, make sure that the what the government and parliament want to be the decisions that they want happening are actually being taken in the right way. And so putting these two things together, we hope can provide better outcomes, because better outcomes on regulation means better industry, more economic growth. It's growth, yeah, I mean, on the point of growth, I mean, the Financial Conduct Authority, the government has already said it wants it to make the UK's financial services sector more competitive. That's part of its mandate now. The industry itself has pushed back on that. Well, part of one of the... the we did a lot of work speaking to lots of people in different industries, not just financial services, it's worth saying. You mentioned energy, uh, other areas of, our, of the regulated economy. 
a big thing is that often the intentions, the good intentions of government, parliament and the regulators themselves somehow are not finding their way through on the ground and how they're implemented. That's why we need to do this work. It's not to say, oh, this regulator's good or that regulator's bad. It's to say, how can we hold you more accountable for the decisions that are being taken? And that through that transparency and accountability, we will get better rulemaking and then more economic growth at the same time. Is the quality of regulators themselves high enough in this country? I mean, a lot of them are not paid an awful lot. I mean, if you look at the FCA, for example, uh, I shouldn't just keep going about financial services, but it's had a real stream of people that have just left and gone into jobs in the city, in the private sector. Yeah, so one of the things in our report is to talk about the culture within the regulators and to help each of them retain and grow and develop more high quality people. One way in which we can do that is having better relationships between industry and regulators so that that relationship can be better informed on the regulatory side and on the industry side, making sure they have a better understanding about what the regulator is trying to achieve. And through that, on top of transparency, on top of more clear accountability, we think we can get a better system. Better relations between industry and regulator. A lot of people will say, oh, that smacks of regulatory capture. It doesn't for this precise reason. Better, better relationship does not mean that industry will like the decisions, every decision of a regulator. And what somebody very senior in Downing Street said to me the other day was, well, Bim, if industry's complaining and government's complaining and the regulator's complaining, maybe the grit in the system is often working if everybody's <laughs> a little bit unhappy. And I can appreciate that. Better relationship does, however, mean that regulatory independence, which is a core principle in our system and one that we should maintain, does not mean regulatory immunity. And we've got to make sure that if stakeholders in the industry feel that they've been hard done by, there are appropriate mechanisms for them to raise that in a way that doesn't damage their relationship with the regulator. And frankly, on speaking to regulators, they would welcome better relationships as well. All right, we've only got about 30 seconds left, Bim. Give me, give me a cue. Thank you. Tell me, tell me uh, which regulator's doing a good job in your view right now and where there's not a problem. Well, um, sorry. There are, there are good people in all regulators doing, doing good jobs. I think one person I would highlight, I think the PRA, and I think the role that Sam Woods, for example, played on the Silicon Valley Bank transaction with HSBC, and for avoidance of doubt, I used to work at HSBC, um, but for the, uh, the role he played there, everybody says he did a fantastic job. Very good, Bim. Great to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. That's it from me. I'm back at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, coming up after this short break, it's Jane Secker. Don't go away. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio.